And, uh, and we're here. Um, I'm Stephen Neely, um, and my co-host um, is Veronica Bileski and Emma Shubin. Um, and we are just thrilled to welcome everybody to um, uh, what we're calling season two. Uh, we don't really have a good plan on how to organize all of this stuff, but we met all summer long um, and racked up 13 or 12, 12 13 um, meetings. Uh, plus uh, five master classes, and uh, now in the fall term here, or fall for the the North America anyway, um, here in um, September, uh, September through December, we're calling our next season, and we've got a whole series of of meetups that are scheduled on our calendar, as well as four great uh, master classes. I'm gonna let Veronica tell us anything she wants to tell us before we move ahead. Um, it's just really lovely to see old friends and friends we haven't seen in a while and new friends. Um, so thank you all for being here and making the time. Um, I posted an agenda for today. Um, it's a Google Doc and um, we have five presenters today, which is really awesome. And um, we encourage you all to sign up for the master classes, which start in about two weeks. And um, Sui Ming is here tonight and she'll be teaching the first one. So we're thrilled for that. and. Um, we three more later on. Um, and I'm, I think I'm, before we introduce the presenters, I just wanted to um, do the breakout room tradition, right? So we're gonna put um, ourselves in groups of about three or four people. And if you could just introduce yourself um, to the couple of people in your breakout room, um, you'll be put there automatically. And um, yeah, tell them who you are, where you are, what you who you teach. Who you teach. Very good. So um, you only get about two minutes for this. So you got to go kind of quick. You ready? Here mm -hmm. you go. Wait, here you go. Recording. <coughs> Hopefully you had a, uh, an, an, a just enough time to say hi to somebody and wish you had more time. That's the plan. That's the Eurythmics teacher hook. That's what we do. We get you just enough to feel like you won a little bit more and you could have done better if I had just given you a little bit more time. I could have done better. That's what it's supposed to feel like. Um, uh, uh, we have, um, we've got a couple people um, to present tonight. Um, do we, Veronica, do we want to introduce everybody first and just say yeah what's just so that people know what order so um we keep these presentations to five minutes so that we have enough time for everyone and to save some time for discussion um we have five presenters tonight and then one question that someone emailed to me and i don't think she's here but it's a discussion question um and kind of like a polling of information so um the presentations are in this order Stephen Neely, Chris Rose, Francoise Lombard, Cindy Fox, and Mimi Zhu. Did I say it right, Mimi? Zhu. I practiced. Mimi Zhu, you are doing Zhu. very good. Thank you. Okay, working on it. And um, I will give you a one minute warning. And again, it's not to be rude, it's just to give everyone enough time. So without further ado, Stephen, the floor is yours. Okay, so hey everyone. Um, we at Carnegie Mellon, um, so I teach at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, and I teach all of the um, Eurythmics classes there. Um, all together, I have about, this semester, I have about 110 students um, split between the freshman and sophomore cohorts, um, and these are required four semesters um, that all of our students participate in. They get about 150 hours with me required in their music major curriculum. Um, and so when COVID hit and it was time to, um, wait, I'm sorry, I'm hearing a echo background. So is it me or, can I ask you all to just um, to, to mute? Thank you so much. Um, uh, when COVID hit, uh, we were all of course just thrown to the Zoom uh, back in the spring and it was really uncomfortable and difficult and frustrating. Um, and, and I was super depressed about it because I just felt like I was doing terrible work um, and barely serving my students um, the way that we're all accustomed to. And so then I had a, um, a good summer to um, both work with actually a couple of you and a, you know, a nice group of adults. We did teacher training and some, just some advanced work. And it, what was really nice about working with adults 
um, who didn't need a transcript um, was we were able to be a bit more playful um, with it and to do some continued experiments with how to deliver. Um, and one of the nice things that came up in my classes is that a number of my students chose to take my Zoom class outside because they had good internet connection and had good cell phone service, so why not? So they took their little cell phone and they put it on a stump in the park and they participated in the same class through Zoom, but just outside. Um, and, I, and it was wonderful because they had great light and they had lots of room to move around and they could leap and frolic and, and it was great. Um, unlike my very sad undergrads back in the spring who were stuck at the foot of their bed in like a two foot square box and it was just really hard for them to be able to move around. So one idea that came up over the summer was outside is good. Um, one of the problems that maybe you all have thought about before as I had for many years was that outside sounds nice, but the hardest thing I've always thought about outside was the acoustics and that there never seems to be a way to get good acoustics outside unless you wanna to go to the rock concert version of amplification, which to me feels very anti-eurythmics. Um, my normal eurythmic studio has a nine foot Steinway Concert Grand in a room just big enough for like a class of 20 movers. And so it's intimate and I can play pianissimo and my students can feel it. They can, they can feel the literal vibrations of the piano. And so outside, we've just never been able to pull that off. Um, but because I had extra need to solve the problems of my life, um, I dedicated a lot more effort to trying to figure it out. Um, there's a thing called, um, so I did some investigating and have been snooping around all summer. There's something in New York City called um, Improv Everywhere, which maybe you're familiar with this group. Um, and they are sort of the, the kings of the instant flash mob. They're able to somehow corral sometimes 500 or more people all at once and make them look like they're doing something with no rehearsal. And they're, they're just like amazing at it. And one of their projects is called the MP3 Experiment, um, where they have everybody download a a playlist and an app, and then they announce to their mailing list, show up at this hillside in Central Park at the assigned time. And everybody shows up, they download the app, they download the playlist, and when they push play on the app, the app syncs everybody's playlist to play at the exact same time. So everybody on the hillside is listening through headphones to the exact same music at the exact same time. And there's a narrator who then tells them what to do, and then hilarity ensues, as they do silly things that the narrator makes them do. And so there's a way for a shared experience to feel personal outside. And so I had thought about that a lot. And then there's this other thing that you've maybe heard of called silent disco, where you can pay <laughs> cover one charge. Minute, okay, one minute, is that what you said? That's ridiculous. You pay a cover charge and you go to a club and they give you a set of headphones and a power pack and you can hear the music that everyone else is playing. So the only thing left to solve was um, what is the technology that lets me do it live instead of pre-recorded um, and FM radio was the thing we came up with. So what we've done is set up a mini FM radio station on my college campus on one of the beautiful lawns um, and my students show up with headphones. We gave them all FM receivers and I have a digital piano, which is not as good as my Steinway, but it's working and I have a microphone um, and I have a computer that can also play audio and anything I play say um, pops up in their headphones, but nobody on the outside of us can hear it. So it's really funny, like silent disco, that no one else can hear unless you're in the club to have the headphones. And I'm gonna steal an extra minute because I helped organize this thing. Um, so here are a couple quick pictures. So this is my, can you see? This is my studio. Yep. This is my, new, this is my new studio. Oh, come on, it's not gonna let me page through. Darn it. All right. Uh, Darn it. I really thought I had that working. Um, how about this? Can you see? You can't see that, can you? No, I just see the cut. Resume, share, how about? No, no, darn it. Okay, hold on, I'm gonna try again. Here. Do you have the video that you sent me of like the people moving silently? Yeah, I'm gonna totally show that. I'm gonna show okay. that, I swear I'm gonna show that. And I'm gonna do it really fast. The, um, nope, 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 uh, and this is when with my own students, I say, old man with technology. That's what we say. Okay, so here very quickly are some pictures. So this is 
me and my whiteboard. Oh, really? It's okay. There. I assume you can see these things. The, um, there's the Zoom screen because I not only have students on the field, I have students in Zoom who are looking at the field and they're participating at home. That's my classroom. And so far in Pittsburgh, I swear to you, every day that we've met this semester, the weather has looked exactly like this. You'd think I lived in Australia. Okay, then, okay, and then I got, I'll show you a little video. These are not like amazing because they're real. So let's go to share screen. So here's one. So they can hear the music that I'm playing. Sing the four sixteenths. And you can maybe hear them kind of humming in the background because in that particular exercise, they're conducting and stepping and they're singing the rhythm that they're stepping um, as, they, as they go through. And I can give you one more and I have to, I have to give the floor back um, to someone else. Share the screen, quick time. Here's another one, 17 seconds of something. And so that's more than enough, just to give you an idea of kind of some of what we're playing around with. I'm sorry I took extra time. That was very, okay. very rude of me. Um, okay. Thank you, Stephen. Go team. Nice. Um, Chris. Hey, everyone. Uh, it's already cold here. Uh, it was 30 degrees when I woke up this morning. So I can't teach outside, but I am teaching in person at Bennington College in Southern Vermont. I teach uh, liberal arts undergrads. Uh, they are allergic to the word correct. They hate correctness, so I'm from the conservatory world, but uh, today I'm going to do a little thing with figure and ground. Uh, so here's a little ground for you, and you can find a way to move this uh, in your screen. You don't have to see me if you want to go back to gallery view. Find a way to move that music. so I could create the ground and then maybe I invite the students to step the ground flag me down if you can't hear me great so you're moving the ground maybe with the lower part of your body find a different way to move it give it a different shape take up space in a new way great and then with the other part of your body I'll play a little melody on the trumpet here and you'll find a way to echo that just with your movement. My students are great at memorizing little melodies, so I get weird pretty soon. And they don't sing. They, I can't get them to make sound, so they just move it, and I, we get weirder. Maybe a little shorter now. tired of that loop and so maybe I do something different and 
now we try to get him to make a little bit of drum sound. So we might go, let's make a drum beat. You try. Let's make some sound with our mouths now. Bubba bippy de do deep way that new bab join me. Bubba da 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 do da da do da de 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 make some make the words weirder. Scudet a babble do babble goes up a do that book a dot and bled will bed of babs good at a bab bay po bed way bado bab bab web do that babble just to yourself now silently. How do your feet look? How do your hips feel? One See someone else in the room. Great, and so that's just some of the stuff that I might encourage them to do. I want, I, I want them to see each other. I want them to dare to move. They're really brave about that. And I want to slowly dare them to start to make sound uh, with the constraint of a meter. They're really allergic to that. Their music is all boops and beeps, and they just kind of gyrate wildly. Awesome. Great foundation. How do I get them to interact with meter? and conducting so that we can then move on to things like uh, in a Brahms symphony if the tension torques because of some rubato that means nothing to them until I first get them to respect the tyranny of meter okay end of thesis thanks thanks for moving cool thank you so much Chris all right next is Francoise Just make sure you unmute, Francoise. Yes, that's better. I want to talk to you about the audio library I just finished a couple of hours ago. Um, I did an audio library with improvisations, improvisations that I played on the piano on uh, different elements of the music. I have been recording uh, exercises for the pulsation, phrasing, meter, rhythms. I even played some dances and uh, some counterpoint exercises and so on. And the reason why I did that is because I'm teaching not only a professional uh, Dalcrosian, but also amateur, non-professional people, music teachers. And they love to do Dalcros, but they say they cannot use anything in their classrooms just because they are not used to improvise. And some of them asked me if they could record my own, my own improvisations during the lesson. And I said, no, this is not going to sound well and it's a little bit too, too risky also. But I decided to do that uh, at home because I have the chance to have a recording studio. And uh, so I did it. But I'm perfectly aware that I'm breaking the rules that we know as Dalcrosians that we should always be spontaneous and follow the students or create the whole lesson with our um, spontaneous improvisation. And, um, and I still believe that it's very important. But I thought that it would be good to give access to as many people as possible to a kind of a music education uh, integrating some movement. And those uh, music teachers are really uh, happy that they can use now music to have their own classes, their own children move also. So um, it's quite strange because when you, when you have a recording, uh, people have to follow you. There is no way to... But I, I did on purpose, I did lots of those tracks with very simple things, uh, just measures of four beats or measures of three or five to give, to give space and freedom to the students and to give also a lot of uh, responsibility to the teacher because the teacher has to listen to each track 
very carefully and to find also his or her own ideas about what they can do. But in order to help uh, the teachers knowing what they can do with all those tracks, I asked Lisa Parker, who is here, and also Cheng Feng Lin, my colleague of Toronto, and also Mary Bryce. And the, the three of them were wonderful. They helped me listening to, well, they listened to the music and they helped me find the right way to explain and to the good ideas that we could suggest. But the teachers will have also a lot of freedom also to either take what we say or create their own, their own ideas and their own lessons with all of that. This material is also aimed at professional Dalcro students uh, for the improvisations. And I think it can be, it might be a way for them to improve their improvisations just by listening, not that they have to copy what I did, but to give them some ideas about how you can, how you can improvise for such or such subject, you know. So this is it. And it was one minute. Oh, I added some improv exercises also at the end of the, the, the pedagogical guide. So you have the music, you have a pedagogical guide with all the explanations, and you have also there improv exercises that you can do on your own. And I'm planning to do some educational meetings for people who want to really share uh, with the, by Zoom, you know, to really share their, their questions, their problems and the issues that they encounter with all of that. So this is going to be on a website that maybe I could give you, I don't know, I could I give you the of name? Course. Yes, we can. On the chat, that. I will do that after. So yeah. that's it. Thank you so much. I'm so fun. excited. Wow. Okay. Congratulations. Um, if you have a link to share uh, yes. uh, where we can listen to these, you can put it in the chat and we'll also send it out. And oh, then yes, you um, can as you're scheduling to... these meetings, okay. please let us know. You, you can listen to all the tracks on the website, uh, on the on the site. Yes, you can Great. listen to So if that's ready to be public, then please put it in the chat right now. And then yes, that's what I'm doing. Awesome. Okay. Thank Great. you. Thank you so much, Francoise. Um, Cindy. Hi. So I live in Bathurst, Australia, somewhere you've probably never heard of, and hopefully you can understand my accent. Try not to go too broad. Um, so I'm really glad I went after Francoise because that was my experience. I went to my first Dalcro's course seven years ago and, oh, felt like coming home musically. And then I went home and thought, right, okay, I really want to fit this stuff into piano lessons. And I started out really well, and then you get the time pressures of exams and competitions and all those things you have to prepare for. And the bits of Dalcros I could fit into lessons would just start to die away. And I'd kind of forget about it until I went to the next summer school. So I decided to set myself a goal of doing five minute Dalcros. So every lesson we would do five minutes worth of Dalcros um, with the aim of having um, a particular exercise that unfolded over a term. So this terms one has mainly been for my younger students, uh, about five to 10, because uh, my older students are getting ready for exams, which happen in November. So we've just had to kind of wait for now. Um, and what we've been doing has been really, really fun. So we started out really basic. I play for them to move. We just started with walk, run, stop. That was great, they loved it. But then we turned it around and they would play for me. And oh my goodness, the joy. The joy of being able to make your teacher stop suddenly or to catch her unawares. You're making her run and then you stop. And she nearly falls over. They love it so much. And so we've just gradually um, introduced new elements such as skipping. And then we went to adding dynamics. So they're really listening carefully. Lots of active listening. So I'll play something very quiet. I won't tell them what to do. I'll just see if they can kind of see the different quality of movement. Or I might do something really unexpected like an accent at the end. 
and they might be running really softly and then all of a sudden they've got to do like a really big, powerful step at the end. And then I think the best thing, the most creative thing we've been doing here is that once I've had my turn playing and I've modelled for them, they then get to turn around and do it for me. And sometimes um, they do something that's really clear and I can follow it and I can see the musicality. Other times they play, they tend to do like a... And I look at them. What do you want me to do with that? I can't follow that. So it's then them learning how to structure something so that I can actually follow it. Um, so that's something we've been having fun with this term. Some of the other really fun things we've done are exploring different tonalities. Uh, when you're doing, when you're teaching exams and I guess most piano students, you tend to get stuck in major and minor tonalities. So um, I had a class with Jerison Harper Lee a few years ago where we did a lot of different tonalities, Japanese scales, Indonesian, um, all kinds of things. And the one that really spoke to me was the particular Japanese scale. It sounds like this. if I can play it and it just really spoke to me it's such an evocative scale so I took that back to my students and we started working on it so some of the students learnt just the scale that was kind of what they managed over the 10 weeks some of them would um, we started by changing the rhythm then we added different intervals so they might just start by doing That's pretty exciting already. Then they might miss a few notes. And suddenly you've got melody happening. So some of the students... One minute, Cindy. Some of the students would just get a few steps on the way. Other students managed to create um, four minute improvisations with structure, harmony, all these kinds of really cool things. Um, I've got a few students who love improvisation. It's what they live for. And so it was really good to be able to extend them with different tonalities that we don't really use in Australia all that much. Um, yeah, what else do I want to say? I think, you know what, for each topic, I always had a roadmap in mind of what we might do creatively. Um, some students kind of, as I said, got to the first few levels. They might make it through the first three steps I had in mind. Some of them would just gallop and I'd ha be having to invent all these different like little side routes that they could go down. Or hang on, we could go here. We could try this different thing. And so it was really nice to be able to give them a different direction in music because often I'm the only musical input they might have in their week. And that's it. Cindy, awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Mimi. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mimi Xu. I'm from New York City. Thank you, Veronica, for inviting me. And I feel so pleasure to be so many Dow Cross mentors here on the set. <laughs> and I'm so happy to be the last one because each presenter today, everything you did was really bring the joy and uh, music to your students, just with a little tweak. And that's exactly what I've been doing. <laughs> and I think from March till now, especially this past week, I've been teaching Zoom uh, to my K through A students. And actually, be honest, I was really nervous. <laughs> in springtime, we were doing a synchronous and I was doing some Dalcross Eurythmics with some Suzuki program at Queens College. But now with uh, grammar school, when I have 20 students or 16 students in one big screen, I was kind of, oh, what am I going to do? <laughs> and uh, so this summer, I was taking time. I attended Longji's Dalcross program. I attended uh, Neus Fernandez, the Pagimba program from Barcelona. And I taught 
with Jeremy, the DSRDA's academy, and uh, I realized everything we want to share with our students in all levels and all ages. And no matter we are seeing them in person or through Zoom, I think we want to deliver the same experience, uh, deliver the music to them, for them to feel that, to sense that. So I have to constantly remind myself that is my goal. No matter how techy we are, I think I'm traveling through the space in the New York City apartment. As you see, it's very small. <laughs> so I enjoy doing stretching and get myself ready and turn down my motor so I can travel through and guide my students. This is how we do. And then when I come back, I put the clapping in my hands, I can still show them how musical I can move, how musical I can do this in every part of your body percussion, like body as an instrument. And so I constantly remind myself that is my goal and that is my mission. No matter I'm teaching my students in person or through Zoom and uh, taking a deep breath when I'm passing the ball to them. In, at the beginning, I was so nervous, but then say, okay, this is how we get ready. Everybody get your hands up. Okay, now thank you, Ardith, that is gorgeous. Yes, Veronica, Chris, beautiful. So everybody get your hands up, ready? Pass, 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 and stop. I'm serious. You look gorgeous. Pass, 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 and stop. And pass, pass. Love how you use the space. Pass. Thank you very much for participating with me. You have one more minute, Mimi. Thank you. That's good. <laughs> so I really watch my class. Look at every screen. Look at everyone. Make sure we are all together. And uh, last spring when Sandra talked about uh, the audio recording, in springtime, I also make lots of audio recordings sent home and imagine I'm teaching my students. I imagine they are in my head. Okay. Oh, Rebecca, can you jump in this way? Johanna, wow, I love the way you curl. <laughs> so you put all this imagination in your head when you are teaching, even you don't see them or even you see them in front of you. And I learned from my partner teacher this summer, uh, Lauren Hutchinson, she's here too, like uh, really slow down when you talk. There's something I'm reminding myself. Give your student room, like Francois was saying about, you, you are delivering very simple lesson plan, but you give them room to use their imagination, creativity with a little tweak. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mimi. You're welcome. Wow, what an awesome, awesome group. Thank you, Stephen and Chris and Francoise and Cindy and Mimi. And I, I also have to say, I just love how everyone mentions someone else who has influenced them, right? A teacher or a colleague. And it just shows how connected we all are and how much we all learn from each other. Um, so I know that Alice Mosley emailed me a question that we can throw in, but first I just, let's open the floor for discussions, questions, comments on these five presentations. Um, you can type something in the chat and you can wave at us. And I see Leslie is ready to go. 
and I, when Steven started talking about improv everywhere, I did some of their things. And the really cool thing about it is you're outdoors and people are seeing you and it's like a secret. So you're really committed to this secret. Like I think it makes the students really super committed. And I remember at CMU, I wanted to do it with pre-college years ago, but it was before people even had iPads or iPods, I mean. Yeah. So hardly anybody had them, so we never ended up doing it. So I'm really glad that somebody's out there on the cut, secretly doing this stuff. Yeah, the we, were, we were worried. I was, I was very worried about onboarding freshmen, this being their first experience. And it's like you're in the middle of everything. There's public everywhere. There's people walking around. They can see you. And I was worried just about how sort of in the fishbowl they would feel. But the, there's, um, but having the headphones on, you really feel like you're in a private world um, and it feels really intimate and I can whisper in their ear. I have to keep reminding myself. In fact, the silly thing is I never realized, but apparently I mutter to myself whenever I turn my back to my class to like walk back to the piano. Like I'd like mumble things. I have never even noticed. And then, but now I'm like mumbling and they can all hear everything that I'm saying. What do you mumble? Like? I, I don't know, but it couldn't be good. So I've had to really be careful or, or if I have to like clear my throat or cough, I have this like Britney Spears microphone on the side of my face. So I'm always like trying to mess with it. There's been some neat things. It's yeah, well, the, commit, the commitment is really there when you're in that private world. So it's a really cool thing you got to do. So great. Nice to hear about it. Who else? Is it anything? I had a question for Cindy. If you stay to the five minutes and you just stop that dial crows exercise in the middle of the five minutes, because every time I try to do something like that, I ended up taking 20 minutes for it. I'm like, and your piece, like, please play it now, you know? <laughs> like, it's hard to stop. I have to be quite disciplined, and that's why it's quite um, sometimes we don't get all that much done over a 10 week term. Sometimes it's, you know, we kind of, the younger students might not get very many steps through just because I do try and keep to that five minutes. I kind of have my phone there and I just keep checking the time, but I'm really good at judging five minutes now. So it, it's pretty easy to do now that I've been doing it for a while. That was, very, that was obvious. Obviously I do not have any of that rehearsal um, judging five minutes. Um, thank you, Cindy, so much. It was really wonderful hearing and really just hearing you talk, like the joy that you brought to it while sharing the story was like extra um, wonderful to hear. Um, Chris, I just wanted to applaud you for not only playing the piano, but for playing the trumpet as well and finding ways to put that into, into these Dalcros classes that are so traditionally led from the piano with people being able to talk at the same time and for you to demonstrate ways where that actually isn't the only way. I just love that. I'm so pleased to hear that. Um, Johanna, right? You have a question? I wanted to say um, thank you and congratulations to all of them and for having the fun in it, in especially Mimi. Um, to admit when we are afraid, we can over overcome that fear, you know, all the technology that goes with it with a little humor and, and uh, yes, that it's music. It's our thing that we love, that we uh, portray and give some hints and yeah, and we show how we love it. And uh, that was very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Someone else? Sandra here. Sandra. Um, Françoise, I'd like to um, say how much I, I like this idea of yours about recording all these things. You know, people have said to me over the years, oh, why don't you record your improv? And I said, oh, how will I do that? But um, it's it's a very valuable thing to, to do, you know, if you've got a recording studio, um, because I think it makes a big a difference to people, uh, especially people studying improv, they actually need quite a few examples. Yes, I think so, yes. 
And you know, when you're teaching improv, my problem is that I'm showing something and after 15 seconds, I don't remember what I played. So I'm playing something new and it's always something new. And so um, it's hard sometimes for the students really to understand, ah, okay, it's this or that. So if they can replay and replay and listen again, it can give time to find the harmonic sequence, it can give time to understand the rhythm, the melody or whatever, or the playing, the voicing or whatever. So. Very, very useful. Very. Thank you. Well. Chris, I saw you had a hand up. Yeah, I'm wondering, uh, I mean, for Cindy and Francoise and anyone who teaches piano, I'm teaching undergrads who move very freely, but I guess they've already been traumatized about improvising. It's like I can't even get them to dip their toe in the pool. So you're talking about harmony, things like that. I just really just want them to use their voice and just make sounds. What am I missing? Why are they so scared? And why am I confused by that? Do you mean improvise through singing or playing or both? Well, most of them are not instrumentalists and COVID for COVID reasons, I can't like let them come sit at the piano. So I just want them to be daring as daring in their sound as they are in their movement. It's odd to me that they're so free in their movement, but to just make random sounds is like uh, too intimate. It's a mystery to me. Well, what I would suggest with the COVID, it's still possible. I make people, if I am in, in presence, I was teaching uh, last week and I had people singing together with the mouth closed. So <laughs> it's less risky and singing together makes them less shy, you know, because everyone is singing. So you can sing one, one tone, one sound or different sounds but all together all together this is this helps a lot i think to start with and then if they want to go to the keyboard or to any other instrument i would suggest very very simple things to do you know you can even play with one finger or you can but starting with the voice is of course something really good but, and with the mouth closed, you feel it in your body also. It, 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 it gives something like a self-confidence, you know. I think it's also about small frame. So the, the scarier the idea is, and um, improvising particularly with your voice is such a personal thing that I think the smaller the frame, the less choices they have, the easier they'll find it to start. So if you want them to be exciting and um, dynamic t at the end, then you've got to start from this really small place of, can you make one sound? Okay, then can you make another one? What can you do to connect the two? Then you can gradually over 10 weeks or maybe an entire year work up to something that's a bit more exciting. I think Rebecca Campbell is going to jump in and then Lisa. Nope. There you go. Hi, Chris. Uh, I was just typing. I wonder if you uh, have ever tried having them tell a story without using words, but using sounds. So sort of removing them from tonality, removing them from whatever you're playing and have them start to play with their voice or accompany each other when they're moving or accompany themselves. So if someone does a gesture, we're used to being able to pr play that gesture on a piano, but if we play that gesture with our mouths, so if I go like this, and then you have everybody who say, what would you do with that? Whoop, and they start to play with it, but it, it's getting their attention on something else rather than the pressure of, oh, I have to make a sound. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I think I'm struggling making the leap from those theater type games and Lisa and the Chad mentioned something similar. Uh, they're fine with that. I think because they're taking theater classes as part of the little arts education. There's something about once the music starts up, they've all had a 
frightening piano lesson at the age of 10 or something that they're just like ooh, music and so I'm not sure where that disconnect is but I'm gonna do more of the theater games and see if I can slowly merge it with meter um, another idea for you Chris I remember years ago in Quebec we had an improv uh, people who had been moving a lot. You said they like to move. We had um, speaking in a, a, a foreign language, you know, nonsense syllables, but sitting on the floor back to back. So they could hear each other, they couldn't see each other. And so they had to make it sounds uh, with expression to communicate with this person who was leaning on their back. And it, it was amazing what they did. So it just loosened them up a bit and ha they really had fun doing it. So it just gave the idea of the inflection of their voice, you know, actually communicates meaning. It could be they were frightened or they were angry or they were so happy about something, but it was all done with nonsense syllables. So it, I guess it's maybe a drama game, but for personal expression, it really did loosen them up. So good luck. Um, I saw Lisa was trying to get a word in too, so. Oh, it's kind of the same type of thing. I come from a theater background, and so um, there is a disconnect between the movement and then the voice is very personal and it's very, you're, you're listening to it. And people judge themselves very quickly when they're listening to it. So the more things that you can do to get them out of listening to themselves, and often that's having a, like a, a conversation with, like what Sandra was saying, back to back, or even if it's, if you've got some kind of a, if you've got a jazz kind of, one of the things like you were doing underneath it, that's a loop that keeps going and just see what kind of conversation they can um, have when they're, yeah, not using any words, but using gibberish and trying to get something, trying to get a point across. I don't know. Very good. Very nice. We have, um, we still got about nine minutes. So we have some time for, uh, you know, another question or three, and it could be about any of the things we've already said, or maybe. Well, I want to give the floor for Alice's question that she emailed to me ahead of time. And Alice, would you mind just asking it so we hear it in your words and what you're looking for? Make sure you unmute yourself. Still can't hear you, Alice. Is that better? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Just jump in on what you were just talking about. It reminds me the kind of theater gibberish conversation but making yourselves understood reminds me of something I heard Bob Abramson had done. I, I didn't actually have, have him teach me that in the class but using solfege to say things like do re mi, you know, how are you? Paso. And, and it was quite funny using all of the solfege syllables not to sing them but just to make up a conversation. And I think it's a little bit like that. It Perhaps it gives people a, a hat to uh, or a hook to hang their hat on uh, using some kind of uh, easy nonsense syllables like that. Um, as for my question, it was really, I, I'm supposed to teach four and five year olds and I've recently broken my ankle. So I'm not gonna be able to leap around like you like to do with four to five year olds. Um, and I was wondering if part of the time I can use, I think to go to YouTube but I was wondering if there are any Dalcro's YouTube videos for children of that age that might be uh, self-contained, because very often it just shows you the end result of some perfectly performing children, but not the stumbles of how the teacher got, you know, actually opened up the process. And I was wondering if there was that, like even a five, five minute blurb on YouTube, if anyone has that, uh, uh, could could uh, suggest anything like that. And this is the kind of thing that this group can do better than a Google search. So yeah. go human Google search. <laughs> so thank you for, uh, for asking. So Alice, this is Mimi. I think Aaron Butler from New York City, he put up a few Dalcroft lessons on YouTube with himself teaching and his daughter is participating in the video. Oh, nice. And how do you say his, how do you spell his name? Aaron, did you uh, say? Aaron Butler. 
I can type it in the chat. For okay, you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And Lisa, oh, Lisa already did it. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> oh, let me get to it. Thank you. Aaron Butler. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Alice, are you looking for videos so that you have ideas for how to teach or do you want videos that you can actually just send directly to your students and be like, go do this video? Yeah, I would like that. I would, I have to teach about a half an hour. And so with my leg propped up in the air, which it has to be now, uh, it's, uh, it would be good if I could have like a five minute break and say, here's another activity for you with a different teacher and, and show them that. Uh, so it could either be synchronous or it could be asynchronous, but it would be good if I think we had that resource of just self-contained five to ten minute videos, YouTube videos that children could do, because as it is now, they were looking for a substitute and, and they couldn't, but it would not be a Dalcro substitute. It, and unfortunately, it wouldn't even be a music teacher. So uh, it would be good if we could get something that was really good quality and uh, relevant or meaningful and, and fun for children for four and five year olds. Um, I'm wondering if Emma could share what she's been doing with like recordings and like you set up a movement and then another contrasting movement and you just hit play on the recording and then they kind of just like follow along. Oh, um, <clears throat> I have been using this time to really expand the amount of orchestral repertoire that my students hear. I feel like prior to this era, I would bring in a special piece and we might work towards something that was on the piano or on the flute or recorded, but it would be like one thing a semester. And so instead what I'm actually doing is almost every class, I have two pieces that I work with throughout the class that are somehow contrasting each other. So for example, we're doing Carnival of the Animals for the first section of this year. And then we're doing, um, you know, in the Hall of the Mountain King and some of the Pure Guide Suite in the second half of the year, along with live performances of different artists from across the country and different instruments. And so for me, this has actually been an amazing wealth of time for my students to hear things that they never would hear and have guests from different parts of the country that they might never get to see. So a colleague of mine who's a wonderful Broadway music director came in and zoomed with all my kids and had prepared a variety of different things to share with them and so i prepped some activities he knew what pieces we were going to do and he was the performer and they were the movers for example and they got to see something live um, these last couple of weeks they have gotten to see the orchestra on stage and they've also just gotten to hear the music and we've had different activities to explore starting to begin our notation but, you know, first starting with for the, my little four and five year olds, being able to draw with music and have something that relates to high and low or fast and slow, because we're just at the beginning of our time. Um, and so I have found that that has been incredibly exciting for me and for them. And I do fall down the rabbit hole of YouTube quite a lot looking for good recordings, but there's a, quite a lot out there that is great and that you can find even the same pieces again, but with different instrumentation has been really fun to open their ears up to hearing the same thing, um, you know, on a banjo, for example. I have a father in my curriculum who is a really, or uh, the father of one of my students who's a world-class banjo artist from Canada. And so he's recorded some of the pieces that I'm using. And so I, I stumbled on it by accident, but it was a delightful moment in our classes. So I just, I have really enjoyed getting to play a different role to introduce my students to different things that I would not have even considered prior to this, to this time. Very good. Boy, what a nice night. I'm so pleased to have everybody together and to see everyone. Um, we're pretty much, uh, we're just about at the end of our allotted time. Um, before we wrap up tonight, um, I wanted to, um, uh, encourage everyone to get um, to, if you haven't, um, go visit our website at virtualdelcros.org. Um, we've updated it some uh, in August, actually a fair bit. Um, there's now um, uh, a good 
uh, dynamic calendar that posts all of the future dates for the rest of um, this calendar year. So if you, um, we're doing about two meetups a month and one masterclass every month. Um, and we would love to see everybody at everything. We'd really like to push you and all of your colleagues and, and friends to sign up for masterclasses. Um, again, our, our first one of the second season is with Sui Ming, who's, who's here with us tonight. And so we're so excited to feature, to feature her. And so we, um, we hope everybody will, um, will join us for that. So you can see the, all the lowdown on the calendar. You also can subscribe to the calendar. And if you maintain a Google calendar or an Apple iCal, um, you click one little button and it'll automatically um, always keep the right dates and times in your calendar in your time zone. Um, and so you can get all the adjusted time zones just for you in your calendar. So you might consider doing that. Um, there are, um, there's then a page for our archives, which will send you over to the YouTube channel where all these meetups um, live. And so you can go over and we've started to uh, catalog what was said in each of the meetups. And so if you want to remember, oh, where was the time that so-and-so did a thing, um, there's a good chance that that'll be listed out. And so you please go and check that out. Um, the, uh, uh, the master classes are, are listed out on a page of their own um, with both the first round, the first season master classes, and now the second season are all updated um, with all the information. Um, and there's an easy way to get on the mailing list. So if you want to direct somebody as to how to uh, get the emails that Veronica sends out, it's all there. Um, so um, we'd love to just encourage you to go there. Um, and we hope to see everybody at Swimming's um, masterclass coming up. And I'm going to stop the recording right now. So good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody.